So over the past two days, we've heard that call for collective action to focus on the marginalized and address the gender parity in secondary education. We know how quality education can change a girl's life and that of her family and that of her community. How can we then give them that at a time when only 38% of countries have achieved that parity? This penultimate plenary will showcase UNESCO's global partnership for girls and women's education. It was launched in 2011, and its aim is to keep girls in school, scale up literacy and skills programs. So we're going to hear from those involved, hopefully encourage more of you uh, to join the partnership and to get involved and help bridge that gap. I'm going to ask uh, Irina Bakova to start by telling us more about the partnership, and then we're going to excuse her because she has a plane to catch. So uh, we'll allow you to get up once I've just uh, ask you to sort of set the scene for us, Irina, in terms of the partnership and who's come on board and what you hope to achieve with it in the future. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, um, and thank you for uh, organizing this uh, so important panel. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the figures and some of the challenges. Uh, uh, I'm tempted uh, to add a little bit more on this because sometimes the figures are indeed shocking. Uh, we all know that there are 31 million girls out of school. We know that two-thirds of the illiterate uh, people uh, who are 775 million in the world are women. Uh, we know the 60% of the countries uh, have, uh, only 60% 60, 60 of the countries have achieved gender parity in primary education, in 37, uh, 38 in secondary education. And we mentioned these days that if the current trends are preserved, we will achieve gender parity in education, in primary education, only in the year 2086. And we know that despite all the progress, all the advances, challenges are huge. And young women, in many cases, are left behind. So we speak about the learning crisis. We believe this is a teaching crisis. It is a developmental crisis in many parts of the world. We know and we are convinced that girls' education is a basic human right, but it is also a game changer for health, for the prevention of HIV AIDS, for productivity, for income generation, and for sustainable development. And that is why we are more than convinced that girls' education is one of the most powerful factors, transformative factors of achieving sustainable development. We at UNESCO launched in 2011 global partnership for girls and women's education to target the weakest link in education, the transition to secondary education, from primary to secondary for girls, and literacy. Because we believe that this is in response to this widening gap, that girls and women constitute still the majority of out-of-school children, the illiterate adults, the dropouts after primary education, and this also results in chronic discrimination, in chronic poverty, in biased attitudes, and also vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities for these millions of girls. So what has to be done? We have to attract and retain girls in schools. We have to change education systems and learning environments. We have to become more responsive to girls' education by, I would say, being more careful about their physical and psychosocial needs. Um, since 2010, within this partnership, we have established a very dynamic uh, collaboration with many private sectors and uh, all across the world, in Africa, in Asia. We have more than 10 different partners. Uh, of course, first and foremost, I want to mention James Foundation, but we also have uh, a more, more, more recent, uh, I would say, like Hainan uh, Airlines uh, group. Uh, we have uh, 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 Mobilink, we have UN Women, we have Packet Foundation, and we have uh, worked all across the world. Uh, what we seek, in fact, in, in this uh, important area, we seek to increase the number and diversity of our partners, we want to expand the geographic coverage of our activities, and we have to increase the amount of resources invested. We have to promote innovative approaches. We have to encourage South-South cooperation. And of course, we want to encourage the 
donor community, the development community, to invest more in education. And also, we are very much encouraged that all across the world, and even in very challenging environments, governments are coming with very targeted strategies for girls' education. In this particular case, because I have on my left side uh, a very respected and very, I would say, uh, a highly valued uh, Minister of Education from Pakistan, a country that I visited uh, last month, uh, Mr. Uh, Rahman, with whom we are working on, on girls' education, we just launched a month ago a Malala Fund for girls' education in some of the remote rural areas of Pakistan. And I know how much the Minister also and the government is committed to promoting girls' education. I know how much the education community is committed to working with the local communities, with traditional leaders, with religious leaders, with the uh, uh, civil society. My appeal to all of you, and I just spoke with the private sector when we launched the Business Backs Education campaign. We have launched the Malala Fund for seven million, and then we will add more resources. But we believe this is just the beginning of a journey, a beginning of a journey of challenging environment in Pakistan for girls' education. And I appeal to our partners, to governments, to the donor community, to the private sector also, to come and work with us so that we make a success out of this Malala Fund, that we make a success story out of this challenging environment. And we all know, and I have met also while in Pakistan, other also young boys and girls. We know that it is not only Malala who became a symbol, a courageous girl, who became a symbol of the quest for education, of a desire, of a thirst for knowledge and for education and for self-fulfillment. And I can assure you that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of such girls, courageous girls and boys who are going to schools, who are defending their rights to education, who are convincing their communities, and who are convincing also reaching out to the others in order to make girls' education a reality. This is the best way to break the circle of poverty, to eradicate extreme poverty. And I insist on this. If the international community is putting as an objective to eradicate extreme poverty by the year 2030, which I believe will be very much the decision next year, 2015, of the General Assembly of the United Nations, when we will adopt the future sustainable development goals, the agenda of the sustainable development, and this will be the target. It cannot be achieved without investing in girls' education. This is the game changer in the 21st century. This is the best, I would say, um, setting for achieving empowerment, for achieving sustainable development in this world, of sustainable communities, of healthy families, and more economic growth and social inclusion. So my appeal indeed that out of this global forum on teaching and skills, we come with a very strong message of girls' education, of investing in girls' education, and enlarging private-public partnerships in this so important area. Irina Bokova, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. And I have to apologize. The plane is there. <laughs> we will let you get your plane, but thank you for outlining uh, the problems um, so very clearly. And I think because we've started Pakistan, uh, Honorable Minister, I think we will turn to you because those figures are stark. And um, the majority, as I understand it, of the five million children who are out of school in Pakistan, the majority of them are girls. You intend to reduce that figure. We've heard um, the, the partnership is how else do you intend to reduce the number of girls who are out of school? Irina, please feel free to leave. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to meet you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, for the, uh, giving me opportunity to uh, explain the plans we have in Pakistan for reducing uh, the number of uh, children who are out of school. It is actually very, very important, and millions of children, actually there are more than six million children who are out of school in primary education. Uh, and, and we have one of the highest dropout rates as well. And it turns out that our gender parity index is 0.86 uh, for literacy, and gender parity index is 0.78 for 
primary net enrollment, which means 10% uh, less girls are in school as compared to boys. So we have prepared a national plan of action which talks extensively of uh, measures to get all these children back into school, to retain them, to increase the quality of the schools, and our primary focus would be on girls. And there are uh, numerous reasons for which the girls are out of school, um, even though there are certain law and order situations, but that is a very uh, minor part of the whole picture, um, because in those areas there are uh, other problems. The main, uh, and, and there are also some cultural taboos, but a uh, very little uh, percentage is attributed to the, those cultural taboos which are preventing uh, and especially girls coming to schools. But mainly, the, if you look at the problem, there are two uh, aspects which are keeping these girls out of school. One is the access issue. Uh, schools are farther away from home. We simply do not have enough schools closer to all the homes, especially in areas which, are, which have less uh, density in, in terms of population, and they're scattered populations, so we can't have school everywhere and we do not have resources to provide transport to all these uh, localities which are uh, living there. So we have strategies for that, and uh, we want to have a lot more non-formal schools uh, closer to their homes. We, these are essentially a one-room school, which is called a non-formal education system, some multi-grade teaching in a single class uh, and by a single teacher. Uh, even though it's not a perfect way or not a perfect way of giving uh, quality education, but still, uh, if we have to choose between the two, either uh, deprive these, uh, keep these children deprived of education or to give them uh, education which may not be of the best quality, so we choose for the later option. So that's one of the uh, priorities. And similarly, the second main reason, be besides uh, the access issue, is the uh, poverty, extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. And if the parents have to decide um, between their children that if they can afford to send one of their children to schools, uh, it's unfortunately the girls uh, who are left out. And uh, similarly, there are cases in which girls or boys are sent to work uh, in these uh, tender years, and instead of going to school, they end, end up. So we also have a strategy for that, and we have recently evolved um, a certain uh, direction and the strategy and the plan for that, uh, to have a voucher scheme and also to have uh, food uh, for these families, in, in fact, to incentivize uh, them to send their children to school. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, as it was discussed earlier, uh, there are issues with um, economy and issues with the, even though economy is uh, showing signs of progress, and the issues of lesser taxation, even though we are working uh, prog progressively on that, the new government of uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif uh, is, is working uh, very hard towards that. Um, but we also have lesser allocation of budgets towards education in terms of GDP. Uh, so we are also planning on increasing that. So resource constraints are also keeping us going, uh, achieving all the desired outcomes right away, but we are in that direction, and we have uh, increased and we will be increasing further our resources, and the world is also helping us, especially as the uh, DG uh, just mentioned, and I'm very grateful to UNESCO for um, accepting Pakistan's offer for this $10 million which Pakistan has contributed. I'm also thankful to uh, Madam DG for making an appeal to all the countries and all the uh, partnerships and all the private sector in the world to chip in more for this noble cause. And this $10 million which has been uh, spared for Malala Fund uh, has two parts to it. One will be spent across the globe for the cause of girls' education and another part will be spent solely in Pakistan under the supervision and the directions of UNESCO. And we will thank you very much indeed, Honourable Minister. We will be talking about the other private sector input that we're getting with Mobilink uh, shortly. And uh, Soheb um, Ashad, who's, who's sitting on the end there, based in Pakistan. But um, I wanted to pick up on the issue of the cultural taboos and bring in Your Excellency uh, Reem Al Hashimi. You're the Minister of State for the UAE and Chairperson of Dubai Cares. So, 
What has Dubai Cares learned about how best to address these sort of entrenched cultural stereotypes where girls are concerned? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate, very much. Um, and thank you very much also to the organizers for a particularly stellar uh, forum. Particular thanks to, of course, Sunny Barki and um, all the team that, that work so diligently. It's hard to believe that this is only the second year that this forum has been uh, in place. It seems like you have a remarkable reputation uh, for decades, and inshallah, decades to come. I think one of the important aspects uh, for us in Dubai Cares when it comes to um, gender equality or cultural sensitivities is that context is everything. If uh, a particular scenario or a particular method of intervention is applicable in one country, it doesn't mean that it's applicable somewhere else. So the way we've intervened in Pakistan, for example, takes into account specific uh, Pakistani um, uh, idiosyncrasies, which are different from idiosyncrasies with, let's say, the Filipino community, where you have dropout rates amongst girls who need to go into the workforce, whereas it may be access in Pakistan, it's actually employment in, uh, in Philippines, it's early marriages um, in Mozambique, for example. So you really need to look at the context of where you're operating in. And then the second point is, gender parity needs to be part of every single program that you do. You cannot say, okay, I'm working on health and nutrition and I'm also going to build a school. Oh, and here's a separate program that focuses on girls. Across every intervention you have, girls' education needs to be a cornerstone of that intervention. Otherwise, you're dealing with gender parity like checking something off of a box as opposed to it being a very central factor in changing the community. And we've, we've been privileged now, Dubai Cares is only a couple of years old, but we've been privileged to see how it can be transformative to the community when girls go to school. It really does break the cycle of poverty. It really does generate economic employment and economic be uh, benefit. And it begins to also create a very positive impact and a very positive legacy. So I would say that uh, context is everything, that there isn't a cookie cut approach to, to this um, and that it needs to stay at the cornerstone of every single intervention. And where have you had greatest success? Because you deal very much with grassroots campaigns, don't you? So how do you effectively communicate and promote a more positive image of girls and women? I think it needs to, we first need to go in and listen to what are the needs of that community, as opposed to sort of coming in with the answer, to sort of go in with the curiosity and the respect of what it is that these communities needs, or need. What do the parents need? Um, what do the parent-teacher associations need? Also, what do the local governments need? That, that type of engagement is necessary for the success of your program and for it to be actually successful way after Dubai Cares is around. We need to have that uh, internal endorsement and stakeholdership. That's very critical. So I think you go in, you first go in to educate yourself. You go in to learn. And after you have that process, then you share together what you think would be a suitable intervention and you wait for their feedback. Once you have that in place, then you have to have very strict monitoring and evaluation metrics so that three months in, six months in, a year, 18 months down the line, you judge against that and say, has that been a successful intervention? Can we replicate it in other communities of a similar culture? Or do we need to reshape and redesign that program? Very interesting. Uh, um, so, Sahab so Ashad, you are working on the ground in a very practical way to reach some of those girls that we've just been hearing the minister talk about in those remote locations. Your SMS campaign, MobiLink's SMS campaign, tell us a little bit about that and what success you've had and, and how you've been measuring the success because it's been in play for a few years now. Uh, thank you very much. SMS based literacy Sorry, I think you need to bring your microphone maybe a bit closer. Yeah. Any better? SMS-based literacy program was started as a simple unidirectional information-based text messaging service. Over the past four years, with the help of our partners, including UNESCO and local NGOs, we have been able to transform it into an interactive classroom hybrid, a classroom handset hybrid that now reaches out to over 6,000 females across the rural belts in Pakistan. Uh, the project is formed around a simple yet very strong technological framework which works in parallel with on-ground culturally sensitive social mobilization. As a technical facilitator, uh, MobileLink has been able to support the project by innovating and personalizing the education delivery and by offering outreach in those geographical enclaves uh, 
where the traditional conventional education regimes have struggled. The project, however, does not intend to replicate uh, or doesn't prevent an alternative to the conventional schools, but in various ways serves to strengthen the existing system. So, uh, uh, so forgive me, uh, and for people who maybe aren't aware specifically of the practicalities of it, what do you actually, the SMS campaign, it, it, it sort of text-based learning, what does that mean in practice? Do you literally go out and find those girls in the remote areas and give them the equipment they need, and then what happens? Sure. Uh, in the project areas of impl implementation, the principal impediment to education has been the centuries-old socio-cultural inhibitions. The stakeholders appreciated that right at the beginning and, condu and conducted rigorous on-ground mobilization that helped un us understand what will work and what perhaps won't work. The task at hand then was to put together a curriculum that is as effective as it is cognizant of the cultural no-goes. Uh, this was achieved with the help of uh, the local government partners as well as UNESCO's education experts. In order for us to access these women, women who do not necessarily, unnecessarily step out of the premises of their household and to hand them over mobile phones, it was necessary for us to win the blessings of their male guardians. Now that is where the local NGOs came in and they helped us relay the communal and domestic benefits of basic literacy to these households. Uh, once we had the local buy-in, Setting up small-sized, unconventional classrooms at the village elderly place wasn't a problem. Females would get together for a couple of hours every morning for basic literacy lessons and were also familiarized with mobile phone usage. Once they were home, they would receive information-based text messages and were also assessed via MCQs, again, on their handsets. Responses are logged, recorded, and are assessed to evaluate the individual's learning curve. Cellular connectivity has also allowed us to monitor the project's progress at the center as we go. Thank you. Um, well, Joanna, just picking up on that, because you're also working for the, um, on behalf of the Earth Institute, um, you've got your Connect to Learn initiative, so another grassroots campaign working mainly in Africa. Yes, uh, we have the opportunity to work in 10 uh, poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and the project is called Millennium Villages. It reaches half a million people. Uh, across 14 different sites and it's proof of concept that one can achieve the Millennium Development Goals by having an integrated approach to development and investing in education, in agriculture, in health, in infrastructure and thinking about how to bring innovation into those settings. The project is possible in education for us thanks to Ericsson that is bringing connectivity to these sites. There is no real business case for Ericsson to get into those remote places. But by bringing connectivity and working with local providers, both Ericsson and we have been able, as Columbia University, to really experiment what it means to bring this new enabling technology into those poor settings and see its impact on access to markets, access to healthcare, and of course, access to education. And that's how we started bringing initially connectivity into the schools. And MDG on education is really access to primary education. It doesn't talk about secondary education. And we were very proud that we finally had girls graduating from primary schools and being able to go to secondary schools. And that's where we suddenly noticed, no, they cannot go because there are no secondary schools in those settings. And unless there is funding for scholarships for these girls, they will never be able to leave the villages. And that's where we partnered again with Ericsson and decided that, yes, we will raise funds, and that's the Millennium Promise, the NGO, for the scholarships. We, as Columbia University, will work on our side on developing curriculum, developing models of delivery of education in those settings and working directly in governmental schools with the government. And then Ericsson, as technology partner, will bring new solutions that will be cost effective, that will be respectful of what these settings have as technology. So it's not bringing Rolls Royce into those settings. It's really learning uh, by doing. And I think Minister Rim uh, al-Hashimi said also, when you are engaged on the ground, you have the unique opportunity to learn what works in the local community, what are the needs, and you also discover various bottlenecks that you don't see necessarily if you are sitting you know, in Stockholm for Ericsson or for us in New York. 
So it has been a fantastic experience, and the goal for us is to ensure that by having, taking advantage of the enabling technology that is going to be actually everywhere, even in remote Africa's villages, in the next couple of years, how do we take advantage of that to scale up access to secondary education for girls? And by mobilizing resources for the scholarships to make it actually possible for the girls to go to school. And then how is that model scalable? And I think why, what we are doing is not more to have a project where we have well-defined target group and we just want to prove something and write a nice paper about it. We really want to scale it up and it's happening already now where Ericsson is deploying the same technical solution. It's a, a mobile broadband uh, cloud-based uh, information communications technology solution that is cost-effective in other countries. So the project is already being scaled up in Brazil, in Chile, in China. Uh, it's going to be scaled up in India. But I think the important piece for us is working in development and having worked for many years on the Millennium Development Goals to realize that the only way to have sustainable development is by investing in girls, in mm. youth. And the best means is that by investing in their education. Lovely, thank you. And that's something, John, that you've been doing. John Davies, Vice President for Intel, because uh, Intel's invested an enormous amount uh, over the past decade. So certainly a project that is sustainable, um, both in terms of cash donations and also your employees. I understand they've contributed nearly three million volunteer hours. So share with us then what you've learned in terms of what makes for a successful uh, project and investment from both perspectives. Well, I think this may be... Um three programs to share with the audience. Okay, um, three different programs to share with the audience. Number one is the awareness side of it. We're a big company, we have a decent brand, and um, we reach a lot of people. So what we did is we joined with 1010, UNESCO, and we made on awareness a movie called Girl Rising. This is so you could take the stories of those four girls that spoke um, two nights ago at the introduction and did this with nine different girls in nine different countries. It's exactly the same story, but not reach an audience like this room, to reach an audience of millions and millions. It's a film. I've seen this in Sonoma, California, where I live. You could download it if you haven't seen it on iTunes or Amazon. You can share this with your friends. So it really gets the bulk awareness. That's one. The second is we have lots of IT programs and technology programs that we think there's been far more boys engaged in this than girls. And so we have programs like She Will Connect, She Will Code, that are aimed specifically at girls to bring more and more of them into the connection and the coding. We run computer clubhouses, and those computer clubhouses have typically been boys and young men that have run these, put more girls in running them, um, make sure the content isn't just gaming in there, but it's more relevant to the girls. Probably the one that's the most interesting for this audience is where you reach the millions and millions and millions. And we have programs like Intel Teach that touches 12 million teachers has been through this over the last 12 years. And because we have big programs that people love, you can kind of set the rules of the game and make those to encourage um, equality among them. And maybe the most interesting one is everyone here of this has talked about science and engineering. STEM, there's not enough girls in STEM. So we've had a program called ICEF, which is our Science and Engineering Foundation. It's a contest for students. It gets done in um, provinces or regions. It then gets done at country level. The winners go to the US and collect prizes. And there's many millions of dollars of prizes and scholarships here. Well, this program has been, and it's for 16, 17 year olds pre-university. So it's the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, medical, and since 1999, so that's 15 years, 46% of the participants in this have been girls. And that's a much bigger number than you'd see since 1999. And let me calibrate you. In the year 2012, 7 million students around the world was in this. That means 3.5 million girls were actually doing contests in science and technology and mathematics and medical to compete for prizes pre-university. And that's a kind of way of encouraging them. And the way we was able to do this is that program has been around since 1999. 
We've committed funds through this through 2019, so the governments know they're going to be there, and they know they can keep promoting these programs and having the contests in their countries. But at 50% goals, because it's a successful programs, you ask for guidelines. It should be boys and girls, similar and equal numbers. And I think that's one of the lenses we can look at this through. We all have big programs in the room. You will reach many, many people. Put the lens on it and say, let's reach as many girls as boys in these types of programs around education. And if enough of us do that, I think that will help the problem tremendously. Rebecca, you're obviously nodding at that. It'd be lovely. Have you all been collaborating and sort of sharing ideas over the last sort of two days and how you know, the scale of your projects can perhaps help some of the more grassroots campaigns? Um, yeah, we do. We have many, many partners in here and I spend a lot of time going to conferences and events and talking about these, as does our corporate affairs team that runs many of these programs. And um, we've been having the conversations about how we can do more of this. One of our biggest partners in this is UNESCO. The Girl Rising film, UNESCO is a founding partner of that. We do, um, there's a toolkit here that talks about how you go to a government and have a toolkit and a workshops for girls. Well, guess what? There's our name there, there's UNESCO's name there, other industry names there that are all trying to take this to different people um, um, out there in the countries. And so it's got to be done with partners and it's got to be done with as many of your partners as you can. And again, if we put that equality lens on it and almost guidelines, sometimes almost rules for being in the mm. program, it's going to make a huge, huge difference. Brilliant. Thank you very much. You might need your translation guides at this stage because I want to bring uh, Mr. Lee in. Uh, speaking of partners, as executive president of h &A Group, tell us why you chose to support the partnership. You've committed five million US dollars. Thank you, Kate. I have forgotten English a lot, so I think I need an interpreter. Uh, uh, I come from the Hainan 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 也曾经捐助了一些医疗队的资助了医疗队的活动那么我们这次在今年的二月份跟联合国教科文组织合作签了一个五年的捐助五百万美元的教育方面的活动两千年以前中国有个非常出名的教育家孔子我想起英国人培根说过一句话叫知识就是力量我相信除了男人受教育懂得越来越尊重女性以外女性的力量也来自于他们受教育的程度所以在中国有更多的人们越来越关注儿童教育尤其是女童的教育中国人现在的教育方
自己捐助的同时，我们希望有更多的机会参与像联合国教科文组织这样的有系统的，能够使我们的项目的影响力更大、更有影响力，能够影响到中国更多的民营企业参与这样的捐助。呃，至于说有什么样的结果，我更相信像联合国教科文组织这样的机构，有丰富的经验和多年的运作团队，会把每一个我们参与的项目都做得更好。最后呢，我也希望我们能够在这个五年计划得到执行以后，我们会跟联合国教科文组织考虑一个新的下一阶段的合作计划。谢谢主持人。Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and on one of those points you made, um, Honourable Minister Mohamed Balego Rehman, um, about women being in charge, really, behind closed doors, I understand you have five children, uh, three of whom are girls. So what advice do they give you about what needs to be done in Pakistan to get more girls into education? And because we are tight for time, so I'm going to just put two questions in, if I may. Um, there are some success stories that I know you'd like to share with us. So firstly, your daughters and what advice they give you, and do you take it? And secondly, the success stories where you are seeing girls overtake the boys in education. Ah, yes, thank you, Kit. Uh, uh, in Pakistan, we have, uh, well, uh, those people who are, uh, have the access to education and where the families are, a very pro-girl uh, education, and so it's not a problem at all. And in fact, we see uh, there are many uh, girls and, and women who are uh, really uh, making success stories. And even in my home, uh, my girls are very uh, good in education, and they have shown remarkable results. And they always encourage me to uh, work towards uh, having more girls into school. Uh, and uh, referring to the success stories in the society as a general, uh, in Pakistan uh, we have uh, a big number of parliamentarians who are women, and as compared to many other countries, it's, it's a much higher figure. We have had um, a woman prime minister, uh, which was first in the Islamic world, and many countries in the world, um, as of today, haven't had any woman prime minister or premier. Uh, we have had woman speaker, we have a, a, a mountaineer who is a woman, and she has set many world records. And now we have a, a fighter pilot in Pakistan uh, who is a woman, and actually Aisha comes from uh, my own home city, which is Bahawalpur, a city in uh, southern Punjab. Uh, besides that, in education, when we, especially in, in higher education, in tertiary education, uh, we have a higher number of women going to uh, pursue uh, which are in colleges and universities, and especially to talk of medical colleges and medical in, in the field of medicine, we see that percentage of girls in public sector universities and medical colleges is more than 70 percent. Wow. Aver it averages around 73 percent. And at times, on the lighter side, and we find boys and uh, men asking government to. Um, have a special quota for them because they're the <laughs> ones who are <laughs> being deprived there. Uh, so, uh, well, all those who come into education, and they are uh, uh, working very practically in the society. We have many business uh, women owners and executives, and in all fields of life, they're working now. Thank you very much for sharing that. And um, uh, Your Excellency, Remal Hashimi, perhaps I can ask you to leave us with a final thought for anybody here today still debating whether we need to be focusing on the marginalized, specifically on women and girls. What final thought would you leave? I would probably say that um, if you think you're working on an educational program but that but women are not part of it or girls are not part of it, you're not really working on an educational program. It really does sit at the center stone of um, advancing a community, building sustainable development. Unless girls are going to school, the cycle of poverty will never, ever, ever be broken in any given society. But I'd also like to add um, the importance of quality, Kate. I think one statistic that wasn't mentioned in today's panel but may have been mentioned earlier on is that you have 200 million children in school, but they're not learning anything. 
So the quality of education actually really does matter. Otherwise, it's somewhat misleading because you have kids in school, but after several years, they don't know basic numeracy, they don't, they don't know basic literacy, so what's the point of them being in school? Now, that quality factor is a critical component, I think, of a strong educational system. And like I said, unless girls are alongside boys in that program, then I wouldn't even consider it really a strong educational program at all. Well, thank thank you. you very much. That's a very good note to end on. Thank you to all of our panel for your insights and your input, and I wish you every success over the coming years. Thank you very much indeed.